It is my pleasure to be with you to share in our class time together related to understanding why people develop sexual problems, what that is a symptom of, and what we can do to help people who have sexual problems. Also in our time together, we'll be looking at what is the individual's responsibility in dealing with their sexual problem, and what is the corporate responsibility of the church in helping those who do have struggles in this way. Now, of course, most people aren't very comfortable talking about sexual issues, especially in the church, which I find rather odd. Also, I find it very necessary for us to begin discussing these kinds of problems because we live in a very sexually broken world, do we not? And we live in a world that is talking about sex from its perspective every single day, don't we? Even here in conservative Asia, people are still very sexually preoccupied. And after all, we are all sexual creatures in the world of advertising and marketing. They well know that if they're going to sell a product, they're not going to put a pair of tight jeans on your grandmother. They're going to put them on a very well-developed girl because they know that people will look. Sex sells. It's pop culture. And everybody knows it, except the church, it seems. And while we will complain indeed about the Madonnas of our generation. We will complain about the sexual preoccupation. We will complain about the lax morality and the permissiveness of those outside of Christ. That's about all that we really do, do. We live in a world that is sexually broken and it's easy to critique it and criticize it, easy to observe the phenomenon that also washes up against Christian lives as well. We live in that darkened culture where we're so adjusted to the darkness that often we lose our objectivity about how dark it really is. We put up with an awful lot. And while that may not be as true in Asia as it is in the West, it's also true here and increasingly so. All that Western enlightenment seeping in, that freedom and enlightenment and progress and maturity as a nation means promiscuity and permissiveness. That's creeping in here too. So you know, quite frankly, we are beginning to recognize that not talking doesn't help anybody, does it? Not talking does not make the church more relevant. Not talking does not make us more effective and in tune with the needs of our generation. Not talking does not make us more holy and more pure. Not talking makes us irrelevant and ill-equipped to address the concerns out there in a world that is very sexually broken. How broken is it? Well, let's look at some statistics. Now, these are not Asian statistics, but nevertheless, they are a foretaste of what may be coming down the road. Remember, having lived and worked in the United States for many years, I remember as a young boy growing up in the 1950s and 60s that the United States was very much like conservative Asia. Oh, it's true, like Asia, adultery, promiscuity, homosexuality, molestation, those things happen here in Asia, just like they do in the West, just like they did in the West years ago. But you know the difference is, here in Asia, people still have a consensus related to moral values. They still say, yeah, adultery may happen, but that doesn't make it right, and we won't support it and embrace it. Yeah, homosexuality occurs, but that doesn't mean we declare it normal and an equal lifestyle to the heterosexual married person. There are still sexually broken people here in Asia, but there is still a consensus of values, right? It used to be like that in the West, but it isn't that way anymore. Now we're all the victims of moral relativism, that if you want to live an adulterous life, well, maybe that's right for you, but it's not for me, but both are equal. There is no absolute. And now, 30 years after the sexual revolution that began when I was a little boy, these are the statistics in the United States which go to show you just how enlightened and progressive we are now. This is what we can boast of. One out of every four little girls, one out of every six little boys will be victims of sexual molest 
before the age of 12. That's something we can really be proud of, isn't it? Because we live in a very selfish, individualistic culture where self-gratification is far more important than any consequence related to self-gratification. Additionally, we find that one out of every 10 American women will be raped at some point in her lifetime. I'm sure that makes all the husbands and fathers of the United States very happy to know, but apparently they're not distressed enough to do something about the tide of promiscuous and permissive living. People aren't willing to pay a price to make a difference. And what does the Bible say? Complacency punishes us as surely as the crimes of the wicked. We find in the United States today that pornography is a multi-billion dollar a year industry and that every year up to three million children under the age of 12 are involved in child prostitution and pornography. And of course, we have to protect, uh, protect pornography because after all, it's better to suffer the consequences of pornography than to censor anybody. This is our progress and enlightenment. Now, we began to note a few years ago in our school system that our kids began to demonstrate all kinds of problems like sexually transmitted diseases, increase in teen pregnancy, abortion rate began to escalate. We said, uh-oh, we've got to stop this. We will give them education. We'll give them sex education. And so we taught them what to do with their private parts. And you know what? They took us seriously. And instead of the teen pregnancy rate going down, it increased 618%. You see, we forgot that in teaching them what to do with their private parts, we were also supposed to teach them things like responsibility, social responsibility, personal concern, things like that, and we forgot to do it. Because, oh dear, even though we can talk about things like your private parts and what to do with them, and we can show them graphic videos which encourage not much more than interest in pornography, while we did all of this sophisticated teaching to our young people, of course, here we could do all this graphic display of sexuality and talk about all these private, private issues very boldly in a classroom, but we must not dare talk about something as private as morality and impose that on anybody. So the teen pregnancy rate increased 618%, and you know what happened as a result of that? Abortion became the most popular form of birth control because people don't employ birth control or self-control. You got an itch? Scratch it. You got an urge, satisfy it. What, you're 14 and you're still a virgin? Something wrong with you? That's the attitude people grew up with in my generation. And in fact, 50% of students who graduate from secondary school, they're not virgins. In fact, it's about 75%. By the time kids are 14, 50% of them are no longer virgin. Well, abortion became the most popular form of after-the-fact birth control. The tragedy is 60% of our abortions are performed on teenage girls under the age of 18. Nobody told them about the emotional scars, let alone the physical scars left on their uterus and the emotional scars left on their heart when they found out that, oh yeah, an abortion may solve the immediate problem but it didn't solve the shame and the guilt and the fear. We have aborted since 1973 when abortion became legal. We have aborted over 30 million babies in the United States. 1.5 million every year. In two years, the entire population of Singapore or Melbourne, Australia, completely wiped out. That is more than 10% of the entire North American population dead because of abortion, because people don't believe in self-control or birth control. Now, in addition to this kind of problem, we have another problem. We have a problem of disease in our nation. We only used to have about three kinds of sexually transmitted diseases in the United States. Now, we have 14 and they are not just epidemic, they are endemic. That means an epidemic that is sustained at a plateau. And many of these 
sexually transmitted diseases occur among our teenage youth. Instead of those diseases going down, they're increasing. Instead of education solving the problem and these problems diminishing, they are increasing. And tragically, many of the sexually transmitted diseases that at one time were able to be killed by penicillin are becoming now resistant to penicillin in a new breed of disease. Did you know that right now in the United States, one out of every five Americans is permanently, incurably infected with some type of venereal disease. Most of that is genital herpes. 56 million Americans. Next time you visit the States and shake hands with somebody, you can think about that in a restaurant when the waiter brings your food. 56 million Americans, one out of every five, permanently infected with some type of venereal disease, particularly genital herpes, which gives you fever blisters all over your private parts in eruptions that occur every six weeks to every few months, and it is absolutely incurable. And now we have AIDS. In addition to AIDS, we have a new case of venereal disease every 27 seconds in the United States. 33,000 new cases every single day in spite of all the best education available. People still want to play with fire and people still get burned. And now we have AIDS. We have a new case of AIDS every 13 minutes. One out of every 250 Americans is HIV. There is no cure. There will probably not be a cure. If there ever will be one, it is years in the making because AIDS affects your genetic makeup and becomes locked into your DNA. The cure that we know of right now would kill you. There is no cure so far. And unfortunately, many of the people who got infected with the AIDS virus, 20%, they got infected as teenagers in secondary school. AIDS is not just a problem, of course, in the decadent West. The decadent East also has quite an enormous problem AIDS is expected to be more catastrophic here in Asia than in any other part of the world. And to say that AIDS is expected to be worse than in Africa is a nightmare indeed. Because in Africa, it is expected that one out of every four African adults will not be alive to see the year 2020. One out of every four. We are talking about the end of their socioeconomic system most of the people infected are between the age of 20 and 40, which is the backbone of any culture. They are the productive people who care for children and the elderly. They're the ones who turn the screws in the factory and plant the seeds on the farm, and they are the ones who are dying. They are the college graduates. They are the future for the continent, and they are the ones who are HIV. And Asia is expected to be worse than Africa. I tell Christian young people, if you want to do something with your life and you don't know what God has said to do, why don't you go, why don't you go get some healthcare training and go develop a Christian hospice in places like Thailand or the Philippines or Indonesia because you will spend probably the rest of your life taking care of people dying before Jesus does come back. Particularly in this part of the world where healthcare will be extremely expensive and unaffordable to people. Their lives will not get the life prolonging treatment that Westerners will be able to enjoy. And so they will die much more quickly of their infections and they will need to be prepared to go meet Jesus. Because you know, while Jesus has the power to heal people, historically he isn't doing it related to this catastrophe. And so, are we going to be a brother's keeper? And are we going to be involved in caring for those who are infected? Right now in Thailand, three million HIV infections, and it's just the beginning. Right now in Thailand, there are not nearly enough hospital beds to care for the people who are getting sick. Right now in Thailand, one out of every 10 children, it is estimated, one out of every 10 babies being born are HIV infected. Right now, there are already about 400,000 children who are prostitutes who are HIV. That's just in Thailand. And so, this is the world in which we live. It is a broken world. There are 19 different types of sexual deviations available to us. In addition to all these 
sociological and medical statistics I've just given you, I want to share with you just briefly that there are 19 different types of sexual problems that people can develop. Let's take a look at these. I'll give this handout to you later. You can review it yourself, but I want to go down this list as you're listening now. First, there is heterosexual promiscuity. That means people who have sex before they get married. That is perversion. That is not what God intended. Today, sex outside of God's boundaries, it produces enormous consequences that are sociological, biological, psychological, and very individual, but also which affect the community. No wonder societies bless marriage, because if you are a virgin until you get married, and then if you stay faithful to your spouse, government doesn't have to pick up the tab for abortion and its consequences. Society doesn't have to wrestle with issues like AIDS and venereal disease. But see, we all know better than God, don't we? And ever since the book of Genesis, humans have been deviated in their sexuality because of the fallen nature. And the first form of deviation, that means not doing what God wanted with your sexuality, it is sex before marriage. And everybody knows there are consequences to that. Secondly, there is adultery, sex outside of marriage. Thirdly, there is homosexuality, sexual or romantic attraction toward the same sex. Thirdly, or fourthly, there is incest, sex with immediate family members. Fifth, there is rape, which is listed not only as a sexual crime, but is also considered a crime of violence. It is assault, using sex as the weapon instead of a club or a gun. Sex is the weapon. Number six is pedophilia, which is sex with children. Today there are those within the realm of academia who are saying, so enlightened they are, that some people could actually have a biological influence encouraging a sexual interest in children, and they may be entitled to certain civil rights as well. In the United States, we have the National Man-Boy Love Association. They are lobbying our Congress to lower the age of sexual consent to eight as they march in our city streets, in public parades, as they seek to lobby and infiltrate our school system, and many of them work as teachers, and they are pedophiles. Their slogan is, sex by eight or it's too late. This is our progress. Then there is number seven and eight, sadism and masochism. The sadist enjoys inflicting pain on others because they derive sexual pleasure from that. And there are people who are so confused and so wounded in life that they have come to believe that affection and intimacy is equal to receiving pain and being injured as part of the sexual act. Number nine is bestiality, sex with animals. Number 10 is transvestism. Now, when you think of a transvestite here, you usually have this term confused with the men who dress up as girls and prostitute themselves, as Buga Street was famous for in Singapore. However, that's not truly the clinical definition of a transvestite. Men who dress up in girls' clothing, they're just cross-dressers and drag queens if they are homosexuals. But the true transvestite, in terms of a clinical definition, is not a homosexual and is not a drag queen. It is a heterosexual man, two-thirds of whom are married, it is a heterosexual man who does not wish to be a woman, and he does not wish to be a homosexual. He is a man who will have a masturbation episode when the stresses of life build up and test his manhood. His insecurity and inferiority will surface in a cross-dressing episode done in private. Usually, he only puts on female, intimate apparel like underwear. He's not interested in living an openly cross-dressed life. That's very different from what you think of as a cross-dressing drag queen out at Buga Street, okay? Um, Eleven is the transsexual. The transsexual is a person who rejects their gender identity. They are not meant to be the opposite sex, just trapped in the wrong body. That's popular pop culture lingo. The transsexual is a man or a woman who feels so insecure in their gender that they wish to reject it and acquire the opposite sex gender. They feel more comfortable living in that role. 
because they feel like a failure in their original gender role. Now, that's my opinion. Number 12 is the voyeur. The voyeur is a person whom we typically call the peeping Tom, who likes to watch other people undress or have sex. There is an element of voyeurism in many of us when we go to a movie that's R-rated and we watch people having sex on the screen. The voyeur is unable to connect in meaningful relationships. They lack the ability to have intimacy. So they look through the window, so to speak, and see that which they wish they could participate in, but lack the ego strength to bond with people in a meaningful way. And they compensate for this by watching others engaged in acts of intimacy, like undressing or having sex. That's why many voyeurs, correspondingly, are also very addicted to pornography. Number 13 is the exhibitionist. Similarly, the exhibitionist does not know how to have good relationship connection. He does not know how to have intimacy very well. And the exhibitionist then will be the one who is the flasher who will expose himself to other people, particularly showing private parts in public places. But this is not so much about sex. This is not really a sex act. In fact, the, the exhibitionist is not really turned on by what they do. They are turned on before because they can't wait. Uh, they, the fantasy is in having power over somebody by defiling them when they flash them. It's not so much that they derive sexual gratification through the actual act. It's in the buildup to it. That's the exhibitionist. They expose themselves to others. Sometimes they're very deliberate and outward about this, and sometimes they're very subtle, indirect, like you might not be able to accuse them of having outraged your modesty. Number 14 is compulsive masturbation. While almost every human on the planet will experience this kind of solitary sex, most of us masturbate at some point in our lives. Um, at the same time, there are people who lose control of their sexual urge because they have overfed it. Usually, these are people who have either been violated through molest and their boundaries of control have been erased, or they are people who have so cultivated their sexual appetite that now it controls them. They don't control it. And often, pornography is directly linked to compulsive masturbation. And like voyeurism, exhibitionism, and compulsive masturbation, such people are generally men who practice these three things that we've just mentioned. It's, there's a much less incidence of these kinds of deviations among women. Number 15 is pornographic usage. Pornography. You know, your culture here in Asia does have its limitations preventing uh, com you know, community availability of pornography, and this is wisdom on the part of your government. Uh, in the West, certainly, pornography is more widely available, but nobody has benefited because of this. Pornography is not just what your government declares to be obscene. Pornography has a literal definition, and it is this. Any kind of communication, verbal or visual, that turns you on is pornography. That means the cover of a magazine on sale that you could buy in any bookstore could be pornographic to somebody. That means that an advertisement or an article, much could be pornographic. It might not turn you on, but it might turn you on. See, even then, we don't have a high enough standard in our culture because you can just look at many of the movie ads. Even here in conservative Singapore, many of the advertisements for movies are softcore pornography, and deliberately so, because they want you to look, because they know it will sell. So pornography is not just what is obscene. It is any form of, of, of communication that will turn you on sexually. Pornographic usage is obviously very deviant, and people who practice involvement in pornography often find themselves caught in the famous downward spiral of conditioning. Today's kinky turn-on isn't enough a year from now or two years from now. Now I must have more. Many of the serial killers in the United States, they employed pornography. Ted Bundy was executed in the state of Florida where I lived prior to moving to Singapore. 
and Ted Bundy, his last message before his death, was a videotape interview with the famous Dr. James Dobson. And in that interview, he chronicled his life history of involvement with pornography and how he first encountered it in a trash can, in a, in a dustbin when he was a small child, and how naturally that hooked him, because that's its design. It is to hook you. Naturally, as a sexual creature, this turned him on, and he wanted more and more. He was a very good-looking heterosexual man who had a girlfriend, and he would have sex with her, but because of the things he learned in pornography, it wasn't good enough. He wanted kinky sex. And so he found girls who would have kinky sex with him, and then that wasn't enough. He got into S&M sex, brutal sex, and then finally he ended up accidentally killing a girl because of kinky sex, and that turned him on. And then he began to kill girls and then have sex with them. And then finally, even that wasn't enough. He went after children. 27 victims later, including a nine-year-old girl, he finally was caught. That is the famous downward spiral that pornography will feed. Number 16 is prostitution. We all understand prostitution as a cultural phenomenon that's been around as the world's oldest profession. Many times prostitutes are driven into it because of economic need. It doesn't make it right. But in many countries where men exploit women and oppress women, a typical nation today would be India. There are many women involved in prostitution. They uh, have been forced into this only means of economic survival, often because they've been abandoned by their husbands, where culture will allow them to do this. This was also typical of the Middle Eastern nations, where the men could easily oppress women, and perhaps the only way they could ever make it was to prostitute themselves. And yet in modern culture, prostitution also has a psychological edge to it. Many prostitutes hate men, and one way they get revenge on men is to seduce men and gain power over men and defile men. And why do they wish to do this? Because many of them have been emotionally, physically, and sexually abused as little girls. So often prostitutes, there is a psychodynamic in their lives. They feel corrupted and dirty because of abuse. They feel like they can't ever really be a whole woman and give themselves to a man. What kind of man would ever want a dirty, defiled girl like me? And so they go out and then they spend their lives in a psychological cycle of trying to go after men because they might not be able to get back at uncle who did this to me or daddy who did this to me, but I can get other men and bring them down to my level. That's often a typical dynamic in the lives of prostitutes. Number 17 is coprophilia, people who are sexually turned on through employing human body waste in their sexual activity. That's about as polite a way as I can describe it. I'll add, too, that there are magazines and entire networks in the West that serve just this particular sexual interest. Number 18 is necrophilia. We already alluded to this with Ted Bundy. That is, people who enjoy having sex with corpses. You'll also recall that recently in the United States, where we keep producing those serial killers, there was another serial killer, a homosexual man. He um, was involved in uh, seducing homosexuals, killing them, and then having sex with them and then cannibalizing them. Again, pornography helped to feed this appetite. Then number 19 at the end of our list of deviations are other types of fetishes. That is, anything that is non-sexual but it turns you on, that is a fetish. In other words, if um, a black leather handbag excites you sexually, that is a fetish because that is a non-sexual thing. Yet if there's a sexual attachment to it, that's called a fetish. Well, the reason I share these things with you folks, sharing not only the statistics I did earlier, but this list of deviancies, is to underscore a very clear point. The world is broken, and it has been ever since the fall. But why am I sharing these things with you? Because the world is alone, not just having to bear the brunt of these problems. So is the church, and that's the main point that I'm here to talk to you about. I have worked in this field of ministry for over a decade. And every person I've worked with who has a sexual struggle 
has been a Christian person, and I have worked with 18 of these 19 deviations on this list in the church. The only deviation I have not worked with is the necrophiliac, the person who has sex with corpses. Thank goodness. Um, yet, I have worked with all of these other deviations in the church. When I lived in the United States, I hosted television and radio programs which specialized in helping people who have sexual problems. And 100% of the people who would contact me for help and hope, they were Christian people. Not talking hasn't helped anybody. The church is filled with people who come from a, the fallen world. And we are all sexual creatures, and we are people who also hunger to be loved. Consequently, it should not surprise us that the church would also have people in it who struggle with sexual problems. And yet the church does not talk about this. And so people struggle in silence and in shame, and that has not benefited them. Telling them not to do it, telling them it is sin, may have truth to it, but that alone is not going to solve the problems that people face. The people I work with are well-educated people. Generally, they are materially affluent people from first world cities in first and second world countries. They are people who have it all, and yet they yearn and they burn and they struggle in spite of the best education because sexual problems are not intellectual problems. Sexual problems are relationship problems, and that means that sexual problems are issues of the heart, not the head. Telling somebody that it's wrong and not to do it may be right theology, but historically, this has not helped anybody in the church resolve their sexual problems because our churches are well-educated, and yet people still yearn, people still burn. In the church, I work with people in these five categories. Number one, I work with people who struggle in the area of sexual perversions, like typically adultery or homosexuality or premarital sex. Sexual perversion. Secondly, I work with people who are emotionally dependent emotionally over-attached. Emotional dependency we will talk more about later, but to sum it up, it is a form of relationship idolatry. It happens to straight people, it happens to gay people, it happens to insecure people who do not feel loved. They have a drive within them, we will talk more about. And they look to another human being as the source of their security. Adult people who are actually emotionally like little children. And those little children are looking idealistically to an adult, much like they would to their mommies and daddies, saying, you be there to make me secure. You be there to fill up my emptiness. You be there to make me happy. You be there to meet my need. And if you don't, if you won't, I'll look till I find somebody who will. And if I find somebody that I like, I will overattach on them. I will possess and consume them to meet my need. God is not the source. The other human is the security blanket from whom they derive their security and their purpose and value and happiness. And today, Hollywood encourages this mentality, doesn't it? Hollywood says, hey, all you need is to find that one Mr. or Miss Wright, and that's all you need, you and me against the world, babe. We don't need anybody else as long as we've got each other. That's all that we need. And that is a very unrealistic expectation to place on any lover or spouse. Because quite frankly, human need is so big that there will never be just one other human to meet it all. I was in Brazil ministering earlier this year at a Christian psychologist's uh, conference. And this particular friend of mine, who is a great leader in Latin America, and she is a psychologist, and she is also a divorcee of 12 years, having to raise her daughter on her own. She's now remarried a wonderful man she can trust and respect. And this is what she said to me that she has learned in her own personal journey. She grew up with the typical Hollywood mentality that all of her needs would be met. She would finally be secure if she would just marry the right mate. So she got married and all of her needs were not met and she began to you know, find that that marriage didn't solve every problem in life and didn't meet every human need. Eventually she was divorced. She learned this during her years of divorceeship that she can live a reasonably satisfying, fulfilled, and productive life personally and professionally without a mate. She can find happiness without one life partner, but she would not be secure and happy without God 
and the support of her friends. It wasn't just one person who met her need. It was first God as source and the community of fellowship, those who were a brother's keeper and burden bearers who helped her make it during her difficult years as a divorcee and single mom establishing a career. It wasn't just one human who met all of her need. It was a supply, a variety of people. Yet we live in a culture where people have these faulty expectations from childhood. If mommy and daddy didn't fill up my cup, then I will look to another human who will. And so we have clients in the church who overattach on other humans because God is not their source. Another human is perceived as that hope. And that is idolatry. We'll talk more about that. Then the third category we work with in the church, oh, and let me just back up to point number two. Emotional dependency is often the forerunner of sexual failure. Moral failure is usually um, uh, foreshadowed by emotional overattachment. The boss and the secretary who become emotionally enmeshed, they haven't yet committed adultery. They haven't yet gone all the way physically, but already they've violated a lot of relationship boundaries on an emotional level. They've gone beyond that which is appropriate. Emotional dependency comes before moral failure, generally. Number three is sexual addiction. In the church, we work with people who are addicts to sex. They live double lives. Outwardly, they may be normal, Bible college educated, anointed men of God or women of God, as even some of the biggest names in modern Christianity have shown us, calling and destiny and anointing Good education in a Bible college do not make you immune to weaknesses. And in fact, many sexual addicts live what is called compartmentalized lives. Outwardly, they appear normal, and then they have this other dark area, which every so many weeks or so many days will manifest. They are not in control. And they will take enormous risks to their health, to their reputation, to their marriage. They will take risks where they could be arrested or publicly shamed, and yet they still do it against all logic and rationale and the best of Bible theology. They still do it. These are people who are not just hedonistic and self-indulgent. These are not just people who have a lust problem. These are people who are addicted because only addicts will throw away their lives for the fix. Only addicts have lost control. Fourth, we work with people who are the adult victims of sexual molest in childhood. Sexual molest usually causes three things. First, it makes you feel dirty and ashamed. It destroys your self-image. Sexual molest will teach you things that God never wanted you to know, but tragically, like mythological Pandora's box, when the box was opened and the bad things got out, she could never shut the box again and put it all back like it never happened. And that's exactly true for the molest victim. What has happened will not be erased. The blood of Jesus doesn't make it like it never happened. We'll talk more about what recovery really means later. But it teaches them things that God did not want them to know. And because of the beauty of God's design of the brain and neurochemistry, you don't forget it. Thirdly, sexual molest breaks down your ability to trust God. After all, my clients complain. Where was he when I cried out to make my daddy stop it and I wanted God to intervene and I would cry out and he did not? Where was God and why should I trust him now with my heart? You give me a reason why. I hear it every week. And secondly, related to mistrust, it breaks down people's trust ability, it breaks down their ability to love and trust others. After all, they're never quite sure why you might be interested in them. It's a terrible way of having to look at the world through those tinted glasses. No wonder the Lord says, better that somebody who violates children and leads them astray be drowned than to face me. And then we work with people, number five, who are confused in their gender identity, or they are at least insecure in it. You know, a heterosexual man who's married can be very insecure in his gender identity. That will often show up either as passivity and a lack of male initiative in his marriage, withdrawn and afraid of intimacy in marriage, 
or he can become very dominant and aggressive and abusive because only insecure men ever have to wear the mask of aggression to cover up their fear of weakness. That's the minimum level of gender insecurity. And then it can move over toward the role of cross-dressing all the way over to the extreme of rejection of gender identity like a sex change would provide. Okay? So these are five categories of people that we work with in our churches. And why should we be surprised? Because it's a fallen world out there. And regardless of the continent or the culture, people are people, people are fallen, and people have struggles. And we'll talk more about that. Why is it Christian people struggle with these problems? We'll talk about that shortly. And so we need to understand this is what confronts us in the church today. And because of those statistics I shared with you earlier, it's only going to increase. Yet another problem in the church is, pastors tell me again and again, I've never been educated in seminary to handle this reality in my congregation. I, I, I don't know what to say to people who come up to me and say, my kid is a homosexual, or my, my child is, is HIV infected, or you know, my daughter told me she wants a sex change, or I just found out my husband has been living a double life for five years, or, or, or. Pastors will have to come to grips with this, and whether we're comfortable with it or not is not even an issue anymore. This is the world now. What will it be 15 years from now? Do you think the Titanic will stop sinking? Do you think that fruit will stop rotting? The word decadence defines our generation, and it comes from the root word decay, that fruit which rots. Does anybody here ever see fruit unrot? 88 dead civilizations showed the same symptoms that our own culture is demonstrating. And while Asia may not be part of the globe that's rotting yet, hopefully our efforts here will not just be reparative, but will be preventative to contain some of that rot and keep the water from flooding the lower decks in the way that it is in the West. But already we can tell, even if we are up here on the high and dry, comfortable first-class cabin upper deck, the tilt is there, isn't it? Other problems in the church relate to this, like a bad judgmental attitude about people who come forward for help. In fact, people won't come forward for help. In fact, I find that most people would rather admit they're ax murderers than to come forward and say, I struggle in a sexual area. That's a bad thing in our church, considering everybody in a church is a sexual creature. We need to be able to say from the pulpit, folks, hey, if you struggle with sexual problems, masturbation, lurid fantasies, pornographic addiction, adulterous fantasies, homosexual orientation, we understand, we love you, and we can help you. Don't bear this burden by yourself. We want to serve you and help you. Make an appointment. Come forward and see us. We will not reject you. 30 seconds of a message like that can change people's lives. We must destigmatize this kind of issue and recognize that loving thy neighbor and being a brother's keeper does not mean just telling them, don't do it or else you're bad. So many Christian people have this horrible stigma placed upon them. They think, if I am a Christian who struggles with these feelings, I am an inferior Christian, I'm a bad Christian, other Christians don't struggle like that. And so they don't come forward, or they fear that if I come forward, I'll be rejected and made fun of, because I've had clients tell me, for example, a man who struggled homosexually went forward to his pastor and finally confessed that he had a problem in this area. The pastor made him admit this to the entire church, and then they disciplined him. Now that was almost, in a sense, criminal. That was a misunderstanding of the Word of God related to dealing with somebody who has a struggle in an area of sexuality. He was not living in deliberate disobedience and rebellion. He did not need discipline. He needed support. And so there's been a lot of misunderstanding, and we will come to understand in our time together this week what is the correct approach to people in our churches who will have sexual struggles. And what effective ministry can we provide, even if we don't have a degree in psychology and counseling? What can we do to help people like this in a very practical way for the church now and in the future? And how can we better relate truth to a fallen world that needs to know Jesus is very relevant in the area of sexual brokenness. Additionally, we need to make sure that when people do come forward for our help, we don't do as many clients complain about, 
That is that we betray confidence. If somebody comes forward and they have a need and it's bigger than your ability to help, then my encouragement is that you find out what resources are available in your community, but don't betray the confidence. And if you need to tell on somebody, you make sure that you don't reveal who they are. You can always get client uh, support. In other words, you can go to another counselor and say, I've got a client who has a problem in this area and I don't know what to do to help them without having to tell who that client is. But you'd be amazed at how many people have gone forward to confess their struggle and the whole pastoral staff found out about it. We'll talk about ethical issues related to this, when you need to tell and maybe when you don't. We'll talk more about this as well in our time together. So I really appreciate this opportunity to be here to serve you, to address the concerns that exist out there and how we can more effectively minister, but also to address the very real concerns that exist in the modern body of Christ in a very broken world we live in, within and without. Amen? Amen. In this session, I want to share with you a bit of my own personal experience to better help you understand the principles that we will be talking about in lecture form as we go. This is more than just my history in sin, but rather I hope that it will provide a flesh and blood example of why is it that people develop these kinds of problems and what worked in helping me to overcome a life control sexuality for several years. I did not wake up one day and decide, gee, out of the big buffet of life, I didn't choose to become a homosexual. Now, I don't believe that I was born a homosexual. You're hearing a lot of current information talked about in pop press these days, that people are born gay, gay gene has been discovered, or that hormones make you gay, or that a different brain structure makes you gay. And while these are things worthy of discussion, and research is also still unfolding new evidence in the understanding of biology and how it affects us, including our identity and sexuality. At the same time, in spite of all the propaganda that you've heard, the most current medical information at the end of 1993 tells us that there is still nothing to prove that there are, is a biological influence making you a homosexual. 
there is still no scientifically accepted evidence stating people are born gay. It is not that simple. It is not a matter of some little bio-robot programming and therefore you cannot help it, you must go do. That's not how biology works. And that would also ignore 80 years of psychoanalytic observation and literature. Data which does underscore the theory that homosexuality, or at least many types of homosexuality, are in fact evidence of arrested emotional and gender identity development. The reason you hear so much information these days about people being born gay, and that information generally comes from the West, and in the West, homosexuals, particularly in North America, are a very established subculture with tremendous community influence. They have a lot of control in the area of media. They are called the gay mafia, and for good reason, because they do, for a sin group, have tremendous social power that even Christians do not have, except we have the power of prayer. Few other sin groups have their kind of cultural influence, which determines the hairstyles you wear and the clothing fashions that you'll purchase and the entertainment that you'll watch in theater, TV, and movies, and pop music. Few other groups have their kind of cultural influence. They are a worthy target group to evangelize as a people group goes. And they are fighting for civil rights in the United States where homosexuality will be protected and that homosexuals will be recognized as a minority group. And in America, the only way that will occur is if it, they are discovered to be born gay. Like another race, they will therefore be entitled to certain political, social benefits. That's why they're fighting very hard. But the most current medical information does not prove that people are born gay. In fact, you read recently about this so-called gay gene. Here, if you actually read the article, is what that article says. Some people might have some kind of genetic difference that could possibly result in a greater likelihood of developing a homosexual orientation. Now, that is very different than saying, born gay. Why did I become gay? Well, I don't believe I had a designer gene that made me gay, and I didn't choose to be, so what happened in my own life? Well, typical to so many clients that I work with, I came from a broken home. Now, that did not make me a homosexual, but it certainly made me insecure. My mother was an alcoholic. It's very tragic to only limit her to that definition because she was many more things than an alcoholic, an artist, talented musician, and a beautiful woman who did some part-time modeling. But she did not have Jesus as her master. She did not have his peace to resolve her emotional conflicts. And so she began to drink with the crowd, the glamour crowd she ran with. And drink became her crutch. She became an alcoholic, a closet alcoholic. She got married to my dad and she had me. By that point, she was pretty much a full-blown alcoholic. Neighbors would say that they would come over to the house and find me running around the house at the age of two, naked. My mother passed out at nine in the morning, drunk already. Full-blown alcoholic. That didn't make me a homosexual, but that first attachment with mommy that should have provided security as a foundation of life was not there. My mother, like most alcoholics, she made wrong choices when she was drinking. She began to have an affair with a married man who was also an alcoholic. That man was not a child molester, but you know, when you're drunk, you do things you might not otherwise do. So he began to molest me when I was three years old. This did not make me a homosexual, but as I've shared already, sexual molest makes you feel dirty and guilty and ashamed. Sexual molest will teach you things about sex God did not want you to know. And thirdly, it will break down your ability to trust God and others. I was never quite sure why God let it happen, I was never quite sure why other people were interested in me. My mother was killed about a year later in an automobile accident, another bad choice. She went drinking and driving, and she died. Following her death, my father was counseled by professional people that he should send me away while he began to rebuild his shattered life. So he sent me away to live with relatives. About a year later, I moved back home 
he tried to rebond with me and to establish that normal, healthy father-son bond, especially to make up for that year that we were apart. But I didn't want anything to do with him. In psychology, I had gone through a phenomenon called defensive detachment. In other words, I slammed the door of my heart in his face, saying, you abandoned me when I needed you. My mommy died, and you gave me away. I'll never trust you with my heart. Forget it. That's very sad, because my father's motives in sending me away were very pure. But I perceived them as abandonment. Funny thing about reality, it's not just what happens to you. It's how you perceive it and react to it. Well, my father could never understand why I pushed him away. He'd say black, I'd say white. Years later, as a rebellious teenager, when he would try to discipline me, I would say, I don't care whether you like the way I live or not. After all, you forfeited your right to speak into my life. Where were you when I needed you? How typical of rebellious teens who abandon and then punish the parents because the parents weren't there for them. They take all the values that mom and dad exalt and rub them in the face of a mom and dad that they perceived were never there for them. Well, that did not make me homosexual, this breakdown in relationship to my father. But I'm going to tell you what, the homosexual men and women that I work with, they have these typical trends in their lives. 90% of the gay men and a large percentage of the gay women tell me that they had a breakdown in relationship with the parent of the same sex. Who else do little boys model their manhood off of but daddy? Little boys don't gain their identification off of mommy. They gain it off of daddy. And if that relationship is broken, it doesn't always result in a homosexual male, but it will result in an insecure male, a male who isn't sure about himself as a man. Because little boys who become men who like women, they must first be bonded in a healthy way with daddy. From him, we acquire our masculinity. It is daddy who blesses it in that male-to-male -male bond. Didn't happen for me, and my identity vacuum was empty. I might add, even here in Singapore, typical to my Western clientele as well, 83% of the men and 74% of the women that I work with here who have a homosexual problem, they were victims of childhood molest before the age of 12. When I moved back home with my father, my identity vacuum was empty, and my need for security craved satisfaction. And I can remember as a six-year-old watching the movies, and I would see Tarzan go after Jane, King Kong would go after that blonde girl. The hero always went after the heroine. And I can remember looking at the movies thinking, the girl is always the object of male affection and interest. And if I want to be protected, and if I want to be the object of affection from a man, maybe I should be like those girls, because they're always wanted by the man. Now, that was very faulty logic, but I was only six. I wonder who whispered that logic in my ear. And so I began to fill up my identity vacuum after the girls. Before puberty, children biochemically are very vulnerable to a phenomenon called imprinting. Have you ever seen that cartoon where the little duck egg somehow finds its way to the dog house and the little baby duck hatches out of the egg and looks at the dog and says, mama, and then thinks it's a dog. Why? It went through what is an exaggerated version of imprinting. This is why kids learn languages so much easier before puberty, because their biochemical structure of the brain is a little bit different. They can imprint, and God intended it to be that way so that we bond and imprint rightly in the formation of identity. It didn't happen to me. And there, in my vulnerable wet cement era, where my psyche was imprintable, I began to role model after women in the movies as a survival strategy, hoping that it would make men like me. This is why today, years later, after being a Christian, I still have some feminine mannerisms, because I imprint it. It doesn't just drop off like dead leaves. It's etched neurochemically like a handicap now. Although, gradually, I do change. Over years of time, I get less and less feminine. But you just don't make it go away. Well, 
I began to imprint and fill up my identity vacuum with female imagery, hoping that it would make a man love me. But I found out just the opposite. In my Anglo-Saxon culture, I found out that to not measure up to the standard of manhood meant rejection, not affection. And I began to suffer for the next several years of school rejection because I did not measure up to the masculine norm. You know, about 90% of the men I work with tell me they had a history of being labeled and rejected as homosexual. You know, labeling has tremendous power to make or break you. More powerful than your private parts, more powerful than your hormones, more powerful than your genetic makeup. The most powerful thing that determines what you are and what you will become is what other people say you are. It's called labeling doesn't matter how smart you are, somebody says you're stupid, you will probably not achieve what you could. Somebody tell you that you're a sissy and a homosexual and a failure as a man, and you hear it for 12 years, what do you think the outcome would be? My dad remarried when I was 11. My dad and my stepmother saw these effeminate mannerisms in my life, and they knew I was being tormented by my classmates. They tried to intervene. So, to build up a more secure and masculine identity, I got involved on swim team, football team, track team, I was an Eagle Scout, I rode motorcycles, I went horseback riding, I went camping in the mountains, I did it all, but it didn't heal me. It didn't fill up my need to be loved and to feel secure. It didn't heal me from the injury of abuse. It didn't fix me. And in spite of my efforts to conform and be normal, my classmates continued to reject me. For about 12 years, my schooling experience was rather like being in an emotional concentration camp, where at least two or three times every week, people tormented me, including Christian kids who felt completely justified. After all, I was a homosexual. But you know what? I wasn't one yet. I would come home from school very frustrated and demoralized, and I would tell my parents, I might as well be a homosexual. Everybody else has already had court and judged me homosexual because of my mannerisms. I might as well be gay. But I wasn't gay yet. And growing up in a small Midwestern community in the very buckle of the Bible Belt of the United States, very conservative part of the country, I believed in God. I, I don't remember a day that I didn't know he was there. But I thought God was mad at me and that he didn't like me because of the way Christians represented his opinion about homosexuality. And I heard things like, oh, you're justifiable suicide. And, People like you are hated by God, and there's no hope for people like you. And I can remember as a 14-year-old teenager, and I would go to church, but I had not yet given my life to Christ. I can remember crying out to God saying, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be like this. But I, I can't deny the fact that I have this attraction to the same sex. And I don't want you to send me to hell, and I don't want you to hate me. Please take away my feelings. I don't want to be this. Take my feelings away. Change me. You know what? He didn't and I became disillusioned because my prayer was very sincere. But my, I was completely naive and lacking understanding about the development of homosexuality and how it can be overcome. I just thought if I was sincere and God was all-powerful, then that's all that was needed for him to change me. And I didn't understand that overcoming homosexuality is not about just sincerity and an all-powerful God. There are certain things that are necessary to overcome a life-controlling problem in the area of identity. This is not like stopping smoking cigarettes. This is not like stop taking drugs. This relates to identity, relationship to God and others. It's not just about stopping behavior. It has to do with healing of the soul. And so because I didn't understand this and I meant business with God and he didn't just go, bing, I got mad at him thinking, He's dooming me to a life, and he's not taking it away when I really meant it. You can go to any homosexual bar, and you will find it populated with disillusioned, backslidden Christians. Well, I went to Brazil as an exchange student. The family that I lived with, they happened to be actors in the theater. Destiny, and many of their professional acquaintances happened to be homosexual. Now, where I grew up, the worst thing you could be suspected of was to be homosexual. But now, thousands of miles away in glamorous, sensual Brazil, 
living with a family who were actors in the theater and seeing many of their acquaintances living glamorous, popular lifestyles. I began to realize that maybe being homosexual isn't such a bad thing. And if I would get out of my stuffy little redneck city and into the big city where people are more cosmo and sophisticated, maybe I could be happy and gay. It was there that I decided to stop fighting my feelings. I didn't really choose to be gay. I concluded everybody else says I am and I, I do have that attraction. I guess that's what I am. I concluded rather than chose. And of course, once you make that decision, you take a new path in life. And I came back to the United States armed with a new attitude that made my mom and dad very happy. They didn't know what to do. They loved me in spite of my homosexual orientation, but they didn't know what to do. And who could they go to and talk to? The church certainly wasn't at a place to offer much consolation or good advice. So they had to bear their own struggle with me all alone. Well, I decided that I wasn't ready for university. I was too much of an airhead. Now that I was free to be me, I wanted to live a gay life. I didn't care about school. And I didn't really want to stay at home, and my parents didn't really want me to either. So I decided I would go into the military. Not a very wise career choice, perhaps, but that was 19 years ago, right after the Vietnam War, when the American military was at a low ebb of popularity. They were taking anybody who could read and write. I could do both, and I lied about my orientation. They looked at my paperwork and looked at me and said, mm-hmm. But I went ahead unchallenged into the military, and I began to do what many homosexuals would do then. I lived a double life, good soldier during the day and free to be the other me while I was stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So I got into Honolulu's gay scene. Now, I was young and reckless, and I did all the fun things that young and reckless people will do, running the streets and doing drugs and having to go to the VD clinic and having to get my penicillin. And It was a pretty immature and self-centered, hedonistic way of living. And I had these two gay roommates who were much more mature than I, and they were very concerned about my recklessness, and they challenged me. They said, you know, you need some stability in your life, and we have found something that we think will provide it. We're going to church. We've discovered God, and we think you need him too. And of course, my attitude was, God, oh, please spare me the God trip. I'm not interested in God. In fact, I was quite angry with God. God, the God in heaven who allowed all these painful things to happen to me. The God in heaven who, when I cried out to him for help, he didn't take it away. It got worse. The God in heaven who is now going to send me to hell for something I didn't even choose to be. Well, if that's the way God plays his game in the universe, I can't change the rules. But if I'm on my way to hell, then I'm going to have a good time on my way, and I hope it hurts him very much. That was my embittered, slightly chip-on-the-shoulder attitude. I'm glad that God understood that. I'm glad that God looks beyond what we do. I'm glad that God understood that my accusations against him were not based on the truth. Well. My friends were persistent, and so to shut them up, I went to church. And there they welcomed me into this warm, charismatic fellowship in the beautiful Nu'uanu Pali Valley outside of Honolulu, little white building there with a church. And the church was very welcoming, which was quite a shock, considering I had sort of bleachy, orangey hair and a girl's blue jumpsuit on and these big, thick platform shoes, which, of course, to my horror, I discovered that they're popular again. That is, the platform shoes. and I. I tell young people that if they really want to waste their disposable income on those things, go ahead, and 20 years from now they can be just as ashamed that they ever wore them as we are in this generation. But it was the 1970s, a lost decade. And in spite of my outrageous exterior, the people accepted me, and they taught me a new theology. They taught me that God created me gay, that I should celebrate my homosexuality as a divine gift, and to be anything other than gay would be to cheat God out of what he divinely created me to be. You see, now I was going to the gay church. There are over 330 gay churches. Let me assure you folks, even right now in Singapore, there are people interested in starting such a fellowship here now. Already in Australia, the gay church has spread from North America throughout the South Pacific. And in Australia, one of Sydney's largest churches with 2,500 people is a gay church. The pastors of these churches are seminary trained. 
They know an exegesis of Scripture good enough to make your head spin. They know the Greek and the Hebrew better than you do, I bet. I had never read the Bible for myself. I didn't know. Their arguments sounded very convincing. My two roommates became the first male couple to become husband and husband in a gay wedding, and I was one of the best men in the state of Hawaii. I finished my military career. I got my honorable discharge. They were very happy to see me leave, and I began to go to university in my native Midwestern United States. While I had been free to be the real me out there somewhere in Hawaii, now on this conservative campus, it was a different story. I was not the only homosexual on campus, but I was the walking billboard. And I was standing for my gay rights at a time in the 1970s when the gay rights movement was beginning. Well, I became the object of a lot of controversy. My dorm manager told me I was not allowed to have a dorm roommate because I was considered too controversial. Petitions were circulated to have me removed from the dorm, but they had to turn them down because they were afraid of a lawsuit. And then, of course, I was told that extra security measures were employed for my protection, and then I was even nominated for homecoming queen at the end of the year big football game. And I tell people that competition was pretty stiff, so I didn't win. Oh, and I was very cavalier, and I laughed about it on the outside. But you know, on the inside, I felt pretty much like trash. I felt very rejected. The Christians on campus didn't quite know what to do with me. Half of them did try to reach out to me. There were concerned people who tried to represent Christ to me. And I appreciate that now, looking back. But you know, the problem is they always felt intimidated by my homosexuality. They could not see me as a person in need of a savior. That was my problem, not being a heterosexual. Heterosexual people go to hell. The only people who go to heaven are redeemed people. But they got these issues confused. They kept thinking, oh, we've got to talk him out of being gay. He's got to see that being gay is wrong. He's got to see that God doesn't want him to be gay. They've got to, they tried to tell me, you know, that that was my problem. When my problem was that homosexuality did not make me a sinner. I am born a sinner, and my homosexuality was just one evidence of that. But even if I weren't gay, I'd still be in need of a savior. They couldn't get that simple formula worked out. So even the sincere Christians who tried to reach out to me did not see me as a person in need of a savior. They saw me as a homosexual, and they tried to be right and convince me that homosexuality was wrong. You know what? Being right isn't important, apparently, to God, at least not as much as how you treat other people. The second greatest commandment is not, you be right and convince your neighbor that you are. It is, you treat others like you'd like to be treated. People don't care how much you know, they care how much you care. Why else would the cults, in spite of their warped theology, win so many converts? It's because of how they treat people, not because of their theology. Even the Pharisees may have been right about morality, and they missed representing God to their generation. So they didn't understand how to reach out to me as just a person. Changing my sex life is none of their business. That's God's business. And God would not have the freedom to change my sex life unless I gave my life to him. And I wouldn't give my life to him unless I thought that he cared for me. Do you understand? Loving your neighbor as yourself is never a compromise. And yet so many Christians are afraid that unless they make every visit with a homosexual a sermon on their sin, that they're, falling the right, they're failing the righteousness of Christ. And that's mistaken. It didn't work for me, and it still doesn't work. Well, there were other Christians on campus, and they just said to those trying to help me, don't even bother trying to witness to him. He's a reprobate, you know. He can't be saved. And I thought, oh, what a message of hope from the people of love. I had a bad attitude. But I got a very interesting letter at this time from my two homosexual friends in Hawaii. They had been married over a year now. I had sent them an anniversary card, and they wrote me back a most interesting letter. They said, dear Sinclair, we have done our own research into the Bible. I thought, what a novel concept, reading the Bible for yourself. They said, we've done our own research into the Bible, and we've discovered that the teachings of the gay church are not true. They sound good on the surface, but when you read the Bible for yourself, we think you will conclude, as we have, that homosexual acts are sin. 
but that where God requires us to grow beyond this, he gives us the grace and power to do this. We write this to you today because we are no longer homosexually married. We are no longer living together. We are no longer living a gay lifestyle or ident identity. We are now born again, and we are praying for you. Wah! Well, I had never heard anything like that before. I decided I had a better way to be born again. I decided I was tired of being a vampire. That's what I called me and my friends. We would go out night after night looking for the elusive Mr. Right, hoping that we would find that special one through whom all of our needs for security and love would be met. And we would settle for a party at the disco and sex instead. And I got tired of it. I wanted a long-term relationship with a man who would love me. And I decided the best way to obtain that would be in heterosexual marriage because it seemed that only heterosexuals had the longer-term love relationships. Gay people relationships, especially male-to-male -male relationships, are volatile, unstable, and short-term. There are some gay people who have long-term relationships in the gay lifestyle, but often they cheat on each other as an arrangement in their relationship, an open relationship, to keep it free and fresh. I wanted better than that, and I thought only straight people have better opportunity for long-term marriage. But of course, I wanted to get married not as a straight man. I couldn't do that. I was a failure as a man. That's what I had grown up hearing. I decided I would become a woman through a sex change, and then that way I could find a long-term relationship with a man and settle down in suburbia. Now, I did not have the sex change. People sort of look at me and think, gosh, how much more bizarre does this story get? And I tell people just a little bit more. And why should you be surprised? Desperate people will do desperate things. All I wanted was affection, acceptance, and security. Well, I went to my psychiatrist, and I began my therapy related to a sex change. I went through the testing and evaluation process, and they determined, yep, you will be a good candidate for the sex change. And I was referred to the famous Johns Hopkins Sex Consultation Program, a sex change program at that very famous North American Hospital, not far from Washington, DC. I couldn't believe my good luck to be referred to their program. And I told my parents after I began my hormone therapy and began to grow my hair long, I said, oh, don't be so upset. You're not losing a son, you're gaining a daughter. And of course, they were not amused. It shattered my relationship with them. It's not that they hated me because they loved me. They could not stand what I wanted to do to myself, and they would not support that effort because they said, one day you'll wake up and realize you've made a mistake and you'll hate yourself for it, and we are not going to stand behind that effort because if we do, you will hate us too. If you hate us, hate us because we've made a decision that we can live with because we think you're making a tragic mistake. And I said, well, I don't need you, and I know what I need to be happy, and I'm going to go meet my needs my way. Too bad you can't share in my happiness. And so, I moved to the Washington, D.C. area where I could be near Baltimore, which was a twin city to Washington, which is where the hospital was located. And I began to live and work for the next year and a half as a woman. You see, I had to live as a woman for two years before they would take me to the next stage, which was the surgery. So I had to live in that role, which only lasted a year and a half. Oh, in the beginning, I was outwardly very successful. If people actually knew I was a man in drag, they never at least confronted me with that and I had employment, and I was considered attractive, and I went out on dates, and I really liked the acceptance. For the first time in my life, I felt like I could perform in a gender role without failure. Well, the longer I lived and worked in that role, the more I began to realize this wouldn't solve every problem in life. And I could change my outer packaging, but I couldn't change what I would be on the inside, the same burned out and used up person. Only God could help me it seemed. And it was at that point, while on my drugs, spending 30% of my income a week on drugs, not because I was a chemical addict, but because I had to be numb to face life. In the midst of my meditation, I was into Eastern meditation at this point, even though I never did quite figure it out. In spite of my perverse lifestyle, in spite of the fact that I was disconnected from any Christianity, in spite of the fact there were nobody, there were no people witnessing to me, in spite of the fact I was on drugs and into the occult, that was when Jesus began to reach out to me. One night in the midst of my meditation, I heard the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, 
they are weak. He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And I heard this song replaying over and over from my early days in Sunday school when I was just a normal little kid before I was burned out and used up and before I was defiled and rejected and made fun of, before I was so rebellious having reacted to life that had robbed me. I was just a normal kid once upon a time. And I remember being told as a little kid that Jesus loved me. You know what? I wanted to know if he still did. I wanted to know if my life still mattered to him or was I now too dirty and perverted or did he still love me? It mattered very much to me and I wanted to know. So I cried out to him and I said, you know, God, I'm really confused and I don't know what to do with my life. I feel like I'm at a dead end related to my sex change effort. I don't know what to do with my life. I know you're there and I've never thought that you cared, but now maybe I feel that you do. It's important to me to know, Lord, that not only are you aware, do you care, and do you have a different life for me? I've got to know. Show me you're real and that your concern for me is real. And I cried out to him for a sign. I said, if you don't want me to have a sex change, just give me a sign. I I'll do whatever you want, but I need to know you have a different path. Of course, that's the next day when you wake up and you think, oh, I've got to go to work now. Don't take that too seriously, God. Well, three days later, I had the traffic report on, on my vanity in front of the mirror. I had to listen to the traffic report because to, before I could jump into the car and drive out onto the freeway at peak hour, I had to know what I would be facing. And as I was in front of the mirror getting ready for work, I heard this traffic report, or not a traffic report, I heard this uh, bulletin interrupt the morning traffic report. It was the morning of August the 14th, 1979, when Dr. John Meyer, the program director for the sex change unit at the hospital, Johns Hopkins, he came on the air with this press conference announcement. He said that years of observation have revealed to us that people who have sex changes, their lives are really not benefited by the surgery. Consequently, consequently, we are suspending the waiting list of patients seeking surgery, and we are shutting down our sex change program because we will no longer continue to treat through surgery what is an emotional and psychological disturbance. Well, I don't know about you, but I was really overwhelmed with the knowledge that oh, I asked God for a sign and he shut the whole program down just for me. I was, quite frankly, very impressed. But in the same way, when I realized what had happened, I also realized, if God doesn't want me to be a woman, that means he wants me to be a And I got really afraid. I didn't think I could become a man. Oh, I knew I was male, but I didn't feel like a man. I had no security in my gender role. And I got afraid. And I said to God, you know, God, my lifestyle may be cheap and sinful to you, but you know what? <laughs> That's where my friends are. That's where all my life has been invested. That's where my identity is. At least there I know I can perform adequately. I can be accepted. But what am I going to give up that cheap and sinful lifestyle for? Some church full of bigots who are going to look at me and talk about me and make fun of me and won't love me, won't accept me when they know where I come from? What am I giving up that for this for? And, and then you want me to be a man now that I know that's what you want. I don't think I can be that. People will laugh at me and they'll make fun of me when I try and I don't want to ever go through that again. It hurt me too much the first time. I don't want to go through that ever again. But you know what? In spite of my fear of an uncertain future and in spite of my fear of giving up the only life I had ever known, I wanted life with God and I feared not having Him more than I feared everything else. And so 14 years ago, I cried out to the Lord and I said, this is it, this is my life, take it. And he did. And he began to make immediate changes in my life. For the first time in my life, I had the power to say no to drugs. I had the power to say no to sex. Now, make no mistake, I wanted to have sex and I wanted to take drugs. He did not take away the want to. He gave me the ability to choose what was right in spite of how I feel. And the longer I said yes to God and no to sin, it got easier. But I'm going to tell you what, it was not easy in the beginning. And he did not come along with a little magic wand and wave it over my sin-shattered life. One, two, three, now you're free. Bing, go be straight, date, and mate. It did not happen like that. But anything you feed will live. Anything you crucify through refusing to feed it, it will die. And as I began to starve out the old nature, it indeed 
began to die. Now, what worked in helping me to overcome my problems? Here's what worked. I realized I couldn't bear my struggle alone. I needed people to be a brother's keeper. And I began to go to church. Now, you may not think I'm very masculine now, but you know, this is how I was living 14 years ago when I gave my life to Christ. This was me 14 years ago. And I share these pictures with you, not because I'm proud of it, but I am not ashamed of what the Lord did for me. When I began to go to church, however, I was a very handicapped person because of my mannerisms, having spent a lifetime running away from masculinity, and people in church did not know how to handle me. They were threatened, they were offended, they were whispering and talking about me. And of course, I was already so oversensitized to rejection that this personally hurt me very deeply to see how Christian people could not handle me. It was like being deformed, and people were offended by that. So it hurt my feelings, and I would go home from church when everybody else would go out for fellowship, and I would be left alone, and I would go home and have a pity party. Gee, God, your people aren't being very friendly to me. And the Lord had to pull me up by the collar and rebuke me. And this is what he said. You expect other people to be understanding of you and where you've come from. Well, they don't understand, and you're going to have to understand that they don't. You live your life in front of them, and in time, they will see that your commitment to me is sincere and that what I have done in you is real. And then they will not feel threatened, and then they will begin to trust you, then they will begin to respect you, and then they will begin to love and accept you. And until that should happen, who will you serve? The Bible says, faithful are the wounds from a friend, and better is an open rebuke than kisses from an enemy. Well, the Lord's rebuke hurt my feelings, but he saved my life by aborting self-pity from taking control. So I lived my life in front of people, alone for a while, and then what God said happened. People began to see I meant business with God. They began to trust me and respect my sincerity, and then they began to pour into my life, especially men. My problem was not that I didn't like girls. My problem was I did not feel man enough to pursue girls. And the only way little boys ever grow up and feel confident enough to give themselves to women is when they bond with daddy and the same sex. Men only become men who like women when they have had about 15 years of bonding with the same sex to form a heterosexual identity. And I had missed it. The only relationships with men that I knew, they either wanted to beat me up or they wanted to go to bed with me. I never knew what it was like to have male-to-male -male fellowship to affirm my emerging manhood. And now, 20 years late, but not too late, God began to give it to me through Christian men in our church who were not afraid of me. Men who were willing to go to McDonald's with me and sit across the table from this outrageously effeminate male knowing that other men would judge them because of their association with me. And they were big enough to take it for my benefit. And they would invite me on the camping trips, and they would invite me on the church retreats, and they would invite me on the men's clubs meetings. And they would include me in their lives, and for the first time in my life, I was treated like one of the guys by the rest of the guys. Psalm 107 says this, Some wandered in a desert, finding no way to a community where they could connect and belong. They were hungry, they were thirsty, their lives drained away. Then they cried out to God in their distress and God rescued them and he brought them to a level path and led them to a community where they could connect and belong. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men for he satisfies the thirsty and he fills the hungry with the good thing. My homosexual orientation was not much more than a normal little boy's deep-seated hunger for male bonding to secure his identity. And now I finally began to have that hunger satisfied. That's why he doesn't just take it away. You don't take away hunger, you fill it with the right thing. And so as I began to be loved by men, my homosexual fixation began to diminish, quite frankly, over a few years, because I didn't need sex with men anymore to be loved and secure in my relationships with men. And you know what happened after that fixation began to diminish? I discovered girls. It's a terrible thing to have to go through puberty twice, but I did. 
And now I'm glad to say this past August, I was able to enjoy being a husband of 11 years. I'm glad to be a father as well. This does not prove I am not a homosexual because anybody, in fact, many people do, live double lives. But I am not living a double life. Oh, when I got married, it was quite a nerve-wracking day. All marriages are nerve-wracking to the couple. And I began to talk to other heterosexual people who had never been homosexual, and I found out that many of my anxieties were very normal and typical to everybody who fears commitment and the responsibilities and risks that go along with the rewards of marriage. I'm glad to be able to say that I enjoy my wife in an intimate relationship that is physically, sexually satisfying. I had never been with a woman before. And now I'm very thankful that God has allowed me to enjoy that expression of sexuality, something which I never knew. Because in the gay life, I only knew sex with guilt, a lack of God's blessing. I only knew sex that might have been physically pleasurable, but it was tainted with so many other things like fear and shame and a lack of blessing. Now I'm glad to be able to say that the shadow of my life is not cast upon my sexual union today. And I say that because I never knew if I would be able to say that. But becoming a heterosexual was not God's biggest goal. Being reconciled to him and learning to love and live healthily with each of my peers was what God really wanted for my life. After all, that is the entire law summed up in be in right relationship with God and be in right relationship with each other, isn't it? So God satisfied my thirst for male love and affirmation of my manhood through male-to-male -male bonding. He affirmed me of his love toward me, which gave me grace to grow during difficult days and still does. And he enabled me to grow beyond the control of homosexuality to the point that I really enjoy being a heterosexual man. I enjoy being a man, a straight man. I enjoy my wife as a husband and friend. I enjoy being a father, something I never dreamed possible. My wedding day was also quite intense because it was the first time in almost over four and a half years that I was reconciled again with my parents. Because see, I had been written out of the will and written out of the family and told not to come back when I wanted that sex change. But after earning my parents' trust, after becoming a Christian, after a few years it took to re-earn their trust, they were willing to take one more chance of bonding with me. And they came out the day before my wedding, first time I saw them in over four and a half years, and we were reconciled. So they enjoy today having a son, having a daughter-in-law, and being grandparents. Considering I'm their only child, that was a miracle before them, and the Lord has since worked in their own lives because of what the Lord has done in mine. And so I am glad to say to you that God has given me a wonderful new option on life that I never dreamed possible. And I will honestly say, I will probably never live my life as if I had never been a homosexual. Jesus doesn't give you a life as if you had never been fallen. He gives us a life beyond it. And that's good news that I can offer you today in terms of my own experience, how God took all my brokenness and he worked good in it. And like Joseph, I can testify and say, what was meant to me to be evil, God has worked for good to the saving of many lives. Amen? Amen. Amen.